Stein. Uh, I'll simply point out that Yoram has been a, a longtime friend of uh, not only me, but of the Naval War College. Uh, we've had the pleasure to uh, serve with him as he has had two stints as the Stockton Professor uh, of International Law. Uh, and Yoram has also been a longtime supporter of this conference. So, Yoram, welcome back to the War College, and we look forward to your presentation. Sorry, uh, I said this has been another interesting and successful Newport conference. Uh, by now, the annual Newport conferences have become, in my opinion, de rigueur, actually, for any serious uh, military lawyer or academic who's interested in the law of war, either use in bello or use at bellum, and in law of the sea. Of course, every year the emphasis shifts a little from one subject to another. When we started uh, more than a decade ago, the raging subject was Kosovo. Then it was 9-11 terrorism, Iraq, Afghanistan, and so forth. So each time uh, the focus perhaps is slightly different uh, nevertheless, uh, you can sum all these conferences up by saying the same, always different. Because what do we do? We, in fact, inspect the road that we are all traveling by. Uh, we take a look at the signposts, and uh, obviously we are concerned about any bumps on the road, potholes, and uh, even indications of uh, slippery conditions, falling rocks, and crossings by large animals. And all these things happen, and we have to be concerned about them. And in fact, that leads me to what will be the focus of what I want to, to tell you today, rather briefly, but nevertheless, I think it's a significant point. Because you see, I'm a recidivist in a sense of uh, giving concluding remarks here. And usually what I do is choose uh, quite a few subjects where I'm trying to uh, perhaps uh, bring to the fore the more uh, important uh, dimensions as I, as I see them. What I want to do today is actually pick up one single subject, although as you will see it's two pronged, but it's the same topic. And it's very important to my mind. You see, uh, if you were to be here like the fly on the wall, I think that you will have noticed in this conference, as in many others, Newport conferences and non-Newport conferences, that unfortunately the military lawyers in this country and in the rest of the civilized world are constantly being defensive. You are constantly on the defensive. And the question is, uh, defensive uh, against what and why? OK, let me start with the, with the what, against what. Well, uh, obviously, there is a lot uh, to, defense, uh, to defend ourselves against, because uh, there are barbarians at the gate of civilization. OK, there always are barbarians at the gate of civilization. I mean, the Roman Empire uh, faced them down for many centuries and survived. So now we have modern barbarians at the gate. Uh, my definition of the modern barbarians of the, at the gate would be that of uh, rogue states and terrorist organizations. And basically, they behave the same way as far as the law of armed conflict is concerned. It's very interesting. Take Iraq. There was the Baptist rogue regime and the Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia. What's the difference? Uh, take Afghanistan. You have the Taliban and you have Al-Qaeda. Again, two different organizations behaving exactly the same way. And so it goes. So these are the barbarians at the gate. We have uh, to, to, to realize that, uh, that they are there. And uh, of course, to, to take into account their tactics and strategy. 
So what's new about their strategy, the modern barbarian brigades, as compared to the old ones? Uh, the answer was actually popularized by our friend uh, Charlie Dunlap uh, almost a decade ago when uh, he threw at us the locution lawfare. Charlie himself is not sure that he invented the phrase, but it doesn't matter. Winston Churchill did not invent the phrase Iron Curtain, but we all associate it with him. So for me, lawfare means Charlie Dunlop. <laughs> okay, now, uh, what's the definition of uh, lawfare? And it's been tried here, including by Charlie, by Dale, and, and, and others. Well, the, the easy definition is very simple. Uh, the, the barbarians at the gate are actually using and abusing legal arguments against us for what purpose? In order to corrode public support for our case. Now, this makes a lot of sense, especially since Vietnam. Let's face it, since Vietnam, we are all aware of the fact that the war, which was practically won the front line was lost, the home front. So it didn't matter that so many people shed their lives, and you see all these tens of thousands of names on the wall in Washington. For what? For nothing. Because the home front was not with them. And I do not have to tell military people how they, actually the GIs who came back from Vietnam were treated. So it's a very effective way of corroding support for a war, especially when you use the law. And this is the novelty, because during Vietnam it was not law. It was the political war aims and so forth, the domino effect. You, I don't want to, to bring it all back to you. Not law. Now it's law. And mainly, it's of course the law of armed conflict, and more specifically, if I can pinpoint it, it's the issue of civilian casualties as collateral damage. This is what they are trying to bring up. Now, there is a tremendous irony here which uh, nobody has mentioned so far. I mean, on the one hand, we have, this is why I'm using deliberately the term civilization. We all try to behave in a civilized way to abide by the law. I'm not saying that we always succeed. But by and large, it's astonishing how law-binding we are. On the other hand, you have them. They are completely lawless. They despise the law. They never abide by the law. I mean, when we kill civilians, we kill them because the civilians are collateral damage. Although mistakes happen, I do not have to tell you. But subject to mistakes and accidents, it's always because we regard them, rightly or wrongly, as collateral damage. They kill civilians indiscriminately and deliberately, in huge numbers. Not only enemy civilians, their own civilians. They don't give a damn for civilian lives. So you might have thought that we would go on the offensive and we'll say, hold it, what's going on here? No, it is they who go on the offensive. They are attacking us. And how do we respond? Defensively, apologetically, neurotically, if you don't mind my saying so. Because they get under our skins. And the result which came to light in this conference uh, in two ways, and uh, I'm sure there are dozens of other ways, uh, is fascinating. So in Afghanistan, airstrikes, which are 100% kosher under the law of armed conflict, are not carried out because you want to have zero civilian casualties. What a great way to win a war. OK. Then we heard this bizarre story of the IDF, the Israeli Armed Forces, using uh, these uh, cellular phones in order to issue individual warnings to civilians. Just think of the logistics. We are not talking here about dozens or even hundreds. We are talking about thousands of individual phone calls to civilians. Where do you have any basis, any ground, any hint or illusion for it in the law of armed conflict? Why do it? 
only because of being defensive, apologetic, and neurotic. In this case, psychotic. Okay. <laughs> now, the, 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 the question is, uh, so why? And we have heard actually the answer in a sense. It's not about them, it's about us. Well, uh, let me tell you, I agree, it's about us. We don't give ourselves a break. We actually uh, have a sense of guilt where there is no reason for that guilt. So you may say this is uh, typical of our civilization. If there is one thing that characterizes the Judeo-Christian civilization, it's guilt. But usually there is something there. I mean, some uh, reason that at least philosophers or uh, sociologists or, or psychologists can identify. I cannot identify the sense of guilt. I don't know why. I find that our record in this sense is almost perfect. In fact, it's not only the issue that I've already uh, referred to, namely the fact that we are law-abiding. But think about it. Here is the law of armed conflict. All the provocations of asymmetrical warfare and asymmetrical warfare is relatively new. Not only have we not changed the law of armed conflict in order to make it, in order to have more latitude when facing asymmetrical warfare, but if anything, the law of armed conflict today is more rigorous and more stringent than it was a generation ago. Even the United States, which is not a contracting, and Israel, which are not contracting parties to Protocol 1 of 1977, in this conference, you will have noticed, again, if, had you been the fly on the wall, had you arrived from Mars, you, might have, you would have assumed that both the United States and Israel are contracting parties. On display here, you had Article 52 and Article 57. Everything is clear. This is because it's Protocol 1, therefore it's the law. Is it? I'm not even sure that every single word that you saw on display here is reflective of customary international law. That's the ICRC position, it's not ours. But be it as it may, that, that's the situation here. Now, the interesting thing is, if you take collateral damage, the law of armed conflict takes it for granted, for granted. And indeed, unless an attack against a lawful military objective takes place in the middle of the ocean or in the middle of the desert, there is no way to carry it out without any collateral damage. It's impossible. There is always collateral damage. Now, what does the law of armed conflict say? And here I'm referring deliberately, this is protocol one, for, right? Forget about customer international law for the moment, which if anything is uh, a lot less strict. Protocol one uses the term excessive. Mind you, not proportionate or disproportionate. The word proportionality does not even appear in Protocol 1. The phrase is excessive. That is to say, the expectation of collateral damage to civilians has to be that these casualties or destruction of civilian property, it's both, is not excessive compared to the military advantage anticipated. That's what Protocol 1 is saying. And as many of us keep telling our students in courses on the subject, excessive is not synonymous with extensive. Under Protocol 1, there can be extensive civilian casualties if the military advantage is commensurate. So that's the law. And yet, each time we are, in fact, bringing down the acceptable ratio in our own mind between military casualties, the military advantage, assuming that the military advantage relates to enemy combatant casualties, and civilian casualties. The ratio used to be, I still remember in my days, accepted as 10 to 1. Today, 3 to 1 is already uh, accepted with certain degree of hesitation. And after Afghanistan, I shouldn't uh, be surprised if it will go down even further. So the law of armed conflict does not actually require us to behave in the way that uh, we are taken to task for being in 
as it were, in breach of. And uh, instead of conducting this fight with the barbarians in a way that will be conducive to some results, we respond in an unsatisfactory fashion. Now, there, there was a reference here in, in, uh, at some point by a pacifistic participant here about the need to eliminate war. Okay, war is hell, to quote General Sherman, and uh, you know, if we can eliminate war, I am sure that everybody will applaud. It's not a very realistic goal in our lifetime or in the lifetime of all preceding generations, and I'm afraid that in the lifetime of the next few generations as well. But the interesting thing is that the law of armed conflict is not there to eliminate the hellish conditions of war. It is there to minimize the hellish conditions of war. War will be hell as long as it takes place. All that we want to do is to minimize, actually, the human suffering, the human anguish, the human cost, especially to civilians. We are not, but the law of armed conflict does not wish to bring it down, does not attempt to bring it down to zero, and there is no point in believing that we shall ever do that. So, to conclude this first part of what I was going to say, what we need is mental therapy. Okay, now, I'm coming to the second prong of what I'm saying. In front, we have the barbarians at the gate. Unfortunately, we also have a menace from the back. And it's increasingly important because it is cutting the ground from under our feet. So both uh, standing on the ramparts facing the enemy and worrying about your back, that may be too much and I'm beginning to, to get worried. Now, uh, the menace of the back comes from whom? From uh, those who hoist the banner of human rights in the name of uh, the good uh, objectives that I cannot precisely identify, especially human rights NGOs and such like people. Uh, let me call them for short, human rights nicks. And not every expert on human rights belongs to that type. And I want to make it clear because uh, we have here Francoise Hampson, who is a great expert on human rights, and she has never belonged to that group. And Francoise and I have shared the, the, the days on more than one occasion, and therefore I want to make clear that uh, I'm not speaking stereotypically in a universal fashion. But the number of human rights NGOs that are taking this road is increasing, and we have encountered it in previous conferences as well. Mike uh, had a famous uh, exchange with somebody from Human Rights Watch. You can read uh, at least uh, part of it in the, in the Blue Book. And uh, what do they want to do? They would like, you called it, Mike, uh, bleed over. This is not bleed over or spill over or anything of the sort. This is a hostile takeover. What they want is a regime change, legal regime change. They want us to no longer go by the norms, the signposts, remember I was referring to signposts, of the law of armed conflict, and to replace them by the signposts, by the norms of human rights law. And the most uh, bizarre and extreme example is, of course, this incongruous idea of comparing uh, unmanned uh, aerial vehicles, UAVs, drones, uh, with uh, extrajudicial executions. I mean, that stretches, uh, this, this is mind-boggling. Because those who regard an attack by UAV as an extrajudicial uh, execution apparently assume that 
death taking place in war ordinarily is judicial. Is that so? What death in war is judicial? Every death in war is extrajudicial. Unless you live in the dream world of the United Nations, inhaling the rarefied air which is apparently available there, totally removed from any vestige of reality, and you are thinking apparently of some world in which when two armored divisions meet, they stop, and then apparently the commander of one division takes the megaphone and he says, I'm addressing the enemy, I want Sergeant Jones, Corporal Smith, and uh, uh, the following soldiers uh, to show up tomorrow at dawn, they are summoned for a court martial, and we are going to determine their fate. This is what is happening, this is what ever happened, this is what is going to happen. I got news for you, when such two formations, military formations meet, what happens is without much ado, an exchange of artillery and even airstrikes. So, and it's done wholesale. If it's done wholesale, why can't it be done retail? <laughs> and if it's done by a manned aerial vehicle, why can't it be done by an unmanned aerial vehicle? As we all know, there is always a man in the loop somewhere, or there was one before he or she released uh, the drone. So the, the, this, as I said before, is, uh, is the limit. But unfortunately, it merely takes forward an idea which is supported by lots and lots of people for reasons that escape me. Why do they escape me? Well, first of all, let's consider the merits of the case. The interesting point is that if you take human rights law, it's subject to plenty of limitations stated in the covenants and in the European Convention and in the American Convention, national security and so forth, and derogations in wartime. If you take the law of armed conflict, the limitations are not there and there is no derogation. So you might have thought that it's better to follow the law of armed conflict than to follow human rights law. No, because they practice human rights law, so we should uh, follow them. But not only that, it is true that there are non-derogable human rights, of course. And the most famous example is the prohibition of torture. Well, I got news for you. We have the prohibition of torture right there, explicitly, expressly stated in the law of armed conflict. Show me a non-derogable human right relevant to warfare, and I'll show you the, com the comparable text. So, then again, the, there is a question whether ordinary rules are necessarily better in the human rights law domain. Is that so? I'll give you just two obvious examples. Number one, tear gas. And number two, hollowed point bullets. Both of them are unlawful in an armed conflict, mind you, international as well as non-international. Both, both of them are permissible expressly below the threshold we are allowed to use tear gas in riot control, specifically, expressly. You are allowed to use hollow point bullets against terrorists in peacetime. You are not allowed to use them in wartime. And as a matter of fact, uh, Bill Boothby, for example, who is not here, uh, wrote, in my opinion, very persuasively about the fact that since terrorism has now infiltrated the uh, wartime conditions, we should be able to use hollow point bullets against terrorists because of their stopping power. If you want to really stop a terrorist before he presses the button, before he explodes the, the belt around the, his vest, you need a hollow point bullet. Cannot do it. So actually, and, and I could give other examples, but these two are so v vivid that it's not necessary to, to go further and to show that actually the law may be better under the law of armed conflict compared to human rights law. 
which is simply, you know, sold to us under conditions that uh, by federal law would raise questions of truth in advertising. Uh, now, I do not deny that human rights law can fill gaps in the law of armed conflict. I've always maintained that when the law of armed conflict is silent, for example, about conditions of detention of unlawful combatants, the gap is filled by human rights law, by some basic fundamental rule. Why? Because we don't have a law. If there is no law, if there is a lacuna, something will fill the vacuum. And then human rights law is more than welcome. But otherwise, if we have two different norms, the rule is very clear, and it was endorsed even by the International Court of Justice of today, which is by no means the International Court of yesteryear, and that is the Lex Specialis rule. You have to go by the law of armed conflict and not by human rights law, despite the desires of uh, certain uh, people. Okay, so I am back to the question. So why be so defensive? And why allow the ground to be taken from under our feet? My answer is that uh, again, it's something which, is, uh, which relates to the mindset and which is completely wrong because international law in general is not set by academics. It is certainly not set by human rights nicks. It is set by governments. It is the practice, the general practice of states accepted as law. That means custom and treaties are concluded between states. And if you want to know what the position of states is, let me tell you, they are universally practically behind us. And here I can uh, attest uh, on the basis of the very recent experience, several of us present in this room, uh, like Mike and Wolf and Dale and so forth, we have been uh, working on, for years, on a uh, manual on air and missile warfare, which was done by a larger, uh, and, I'm sorry, Charles, uh, which was done by a larger group of experts, but and which was launched earlier this year in NATO, March of this year, by the Belgian Minister of Defense. Now, prior to the launch, we have consulted more than 50 governments, including all of the P5 countries, P5 plus one, I have to say to the Germans present, all of them. And all of them have accepted, not only the United States, that's easy, the text is leaning in an American direction, if I'm allowed to say so. But interestingly enough, so did the Russians, so did the Chinese. When you meet Russian aviators, you think that they speak differently from American aviators? You think that the Chinese uh, have, uh, live in the dream world of uh, human rights organizations? Okay, but the same is true of uh, practically everybody. It was wall-to-wall -wall consensus that this is generally the direction in which we have to go. We are talking 175 rules accepted by consensus, and lo and behold, the consensus was accepted even by the ICRC. So if you put it on balance, and you see that, in fact, the, the road, as we see it, is followed not only by us, the military lawyers, and the academics who are your uh, fellow travelers, so to speak, on the road, uh, but by all of the governments in the world. I think that we should change the tone of the debate and stop being defensive. So uh, my message uh, to you uh, is threefold. Number one, keep up the good work which includes, of course, implementation, dissemination, development of the law of armed conflict. And number two, the first one was keep up the good work. The second one is keep those others off the grass. And the third is keep the faith, baby.
Thank you. This is always difficult. <laughs> I think all of us here recognize what a tremendous contribution uh, Professor Dinstein has made to this area of law over the course of his life. And probably there is no one who is more respected for the clarity of his argument and the uh, precision of his work. So I say that first. Thank you. But. <laughs> <laughs> With this, you cannot, you cannot object to this. <laughs> um, go to the question of the barbarian at the gate. The problem always is, who is the barbarian? And that, of course, always depends upon perspective. If we take three modern conflicts, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Israel-Palestine, I think what history tells us always is that if the population suffering armed warfare feels fundamentally that an alien is in their territory, whether or not the world has condoned it or otherwise, what we know historically is that the invading army, though they may remain for a time, will not ultimately remain. You mentioned the Romans. I, of course, come from England. We had them invade in 55 BC. They hung around for 400 years, and eventually they went. And the same may be true. So that I think that when we see resistance to our laws of war, and they are our laws of war, even though you say, you know, we have 170, however many. It is always the notion of, I cannot fight in the way they are fighting because I don't have their weaponry and sophistication and so forth and so on. And so it's understandable <coughs> that you're going to use uh, whatever you can. And I think that any nation that is under attack is going to essentially use whatever means they can because they see it as a survival situation. And I think when a nation sees its survival at stake, as Israel does, of course, from day to day, uh, then essentially whatever law we put in place uh, is likely to be changed because it doesn't favor the other side. And that, I think, is the fundamental problem with law uh, when it is being used in a way that we may disagree is incorrect, but the people there see it as a fundamental injustice to them. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, I think in a few years, we won't be in Afghanistan, we won't be in Iraq, and Israel will not be in Palestine. And Ultimately, it won't be a question of whether one side or the other sticks to the law. It will be a question that fundamentally, when people feel a great injustice, they're going to fight against it no matter what. Well, you are raising uh, two separate questions. One is, I guess, more uh, historical, philosophical. Uh, who are the barbarians at the gates? You started with that. My answer to that is rather simple. Uh, those who wish to come within the pale of civilization. And it's very interesting because this is uh, a rule without any exceptions. All the barbarians facing the Roman Empire wanted into the empire. This was the reason for all of the fights. They were there at the banks of the Rhine or the Danube, and they wanted to come within the pale because wealth, health, and everything else were glittering across the river. And when they had an opportunity, they crossed over. 
into civilization. And the interesting thing is, once they crossed over, they were allowed to settle in and so forth, they became the greatest defenders of the empire. So that ultimately, the fights were between former barbarians and new barbarians. So the barbarians went in. In modern times, take a look as to who wants to go into the United States and who wants to go out of the United States. It's very interesting. It's a one street traffic. Everybody wants to come to the United States. Why? Because life is so good wherever they are. Because they believe that this is civilization, this is the future. If the borders were open, instead of 300 plus million, you will have 3 billion people in this country. Now to the second question. I, I would very much uh, encourage you to rethink your position because uh, it's not even merely a slippery uh, slope. It leads almost directly to conclusions that I'm sure you will not endorse. Because that means as follows. I'm weak, you are strong. I cannot win uh, with you uh, with modern weapons because no matter what modern weapons I have, they are uh, nowhere near the weapons available to you. So I shall use other methods, totally ignoring the law. And uh, this has been done in the past. As uh, you probably know, the Black Death in Europe in the 14th century, which killed one third of the population in Europe, was started because the Mongols were uh, putting siege to what used to be once a Greek city on the Black Sea. The walls were such that the Mongols were not in a position to take it because they did not have uh, the rams necessary to break the walls and certainly not, uh, this is 14th century, they didn't have guns yet. So what they did with a the catapult, they took a body of somebody who had died of the plague and uh, pulled it over the walls with a catapult. And the besieged did not realize what was happening and a ship went to the besieged city to Europe. The rest is history. Uh, do you regard that even as uh, remotely acceptable? This most notorious use of bio biological uh, weapon in history. And there are lots of similar uh, situations because if you pursue that, surely the other side uh, can also do certain things. For example, perpetrate genocide. So if there is no other way, we shall eliminate them. I've referred uh, to Rome before and there is a very famous uh, line in Tacitus coming from an enemy of Rome who said they come into Britain of those days, they create desert and they call it peace. It's a very useful way of uh, creating peace. Now, we are abiding by a law, a law which is created by all countries. Today, you have quite a few players out there who do not represent either Europe or former Europe. They are not of European or former European extraction. They contribute to the law of armed conflict. In 1977, incidentally, they had full control of the board. Protocol 1 represents their views, not the views of the United States, and not even the views of the ICRC of those days. Those who are too young do not realize it. I was there, I can tell you. Not the views of the ICRC. These were the views of the developing countries, and they have become law, which is accepted today by 160 nations. Does Protocol 1 uh, envision for a moment the consequences of what you have now suggested? And if you start with the use in Bello, this will affect the use in Bellum as happened actually to the court in the notorious uh, operative paragraph 105 of its advisory opinion on uh, nuclear weapons. So when a country which is nuclear and its survival is at stake, it's allowed to drop a nuclear bomb on you 
when you don't have the nuclear bomb. The same logic applied in the opposite direction. Do we accept it? I reject this dictum of the court as much as I resent the position which was uh, embraced in your question. I'm not suggesting that this is yours. What I'm saying is we have to live by law. The only thing, the, the real ramparts of civilization are the law. Because the law is objective. Nothing else is objective. We have to go by the law. This is the law. As long as this is the law, both sides have to abide by it. And there are ways and means, incidentally, of fighting even guerrilla warfare without having access to the, great, to the most vicious weapons and doing it successfully. And history is replete with examples where guerrilla warfare ended with success, although the guerrilleros were not terrorists. It's important to remember the original term guerrilla started in Spain in 1812 against Napoleon. There were no terrorists in Spain in those days. So the, the, the notion that somehow, again, defensively we've accepted as a given, they have no choice, those poor guys. Those poor villains were forced into villainy. Nobody is forced into villainy. Evil brings that about. And we have to fight evil. Thank you. I believe that you have created a straw man. I was in no way arguing that we should not abide by law. I think all of us who are lawyers know we are dead without law and know that this is the end of it. But what I am arguing yes. is that when there is a fundamental sense of fundamental injustice to groups of people, History teaches us that it will not be law that solves that. That's all I'm saying. And I am in no way making an argument for violations of law by either side. What you are saying with respect is totally inconsistent. What you are saying is that you abide by, you, sub, you respect the law 100%. However, if there is injustice, forget the law. Excuse me. In any clash between law and justice, I'm on the side of the law and not on the side of justice, because justice is a subjective matter. And in every war, you find two sides, each one believing 100% in justice, each one of them hoisting the banner of God. God is on their side. The law is always on one side, never on two. And either you are allowed to resort to measures that kill civilians indiscriminately and de deliberately, or you don't. The law, as it stands, says clearly and explicitly you don't. And I don't care about the justice of your cause. Nowhere does Protocol 1 say these are rules for developing countries, for, I'm sorry, for developed countries, but developing countries can ignore the law. Where does it say that? So forget about justice for the moment. Think about law. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I want to turn the floor over to uh, the chairman of ILD, uh, Dennis Mansko. Uh, thank you, Yoram, for what uh, always is a very interesting and informative discussion. I just want to remind you, though, that God is on the side of the Lutherans, as you well know. <laughs> uh, I just got a few thank yous, and then I'm going to turn it uh, back over to uh, Derek to close the conference. Uh, Mostly thank yous again, our moderators and our speakers, uh, well done to all of you. Uh, the presentations will in fact be hopefully uh, placed on the War College's website uh, in a few days. Uh, they will include Mike Schmidt's trashing of interceptive self-defense uh, when Yoram wasn't here. Uh, and uh, Yoram, I invite your attention to that uh, portion of the uh, video. This was a poor attribution conference, by the way. Uh, the conference, again, is an ILD team effort. I want to thank uh, all the members of the ILD team. Uh, June, in particular, is a, a busy month uh, for the team. I want to thank the uh, reserve unit, uh, Rim Parsons. Please stand up, the skipper. Uh, thank you for all you do for... <coughs> for the college, not just in June, but throughout the year. I also want to thank Captain Breedemeyer and Richards and Kaylee for their support this week. They are members of the unit. 
We also had three other Navy reservists that joined us uh, this month, Petty Officer Hank, Amerty, and Auker. Uh, I don't know, some of you are here, but thank you very much for all the work you've done to support the team in June. <laughs> Uh, again, thanks to uh, Jane Van Patten and Mike Karsten for logistics, uh, and of course, Derek for organizing the conference. <laughs> and then very quickly, once again, I want to thank the War College Foundation, and I want to thank the Israel Yearbook on Human Rights, represented by Professor Dinstein for their support of the conference, and to our co-sponsors, the University of Texas School of Law, uh, Bobby and Derek, thank you. Uh, for representing the school, and thank you for uh, joining up with us this year. Darren Stewart, International Institute of Humanitarian Law in San Remo, thank you very much. And uh, welcome back, Lieber Society and the Law of Armed Conflict, uh, represented by Dick Jackson. Uh, and then finally, to all of you, uh, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, you're a key part of this event. I wish you all a safe trip home, and I'll turn it over to Derek to close the conference. I want to echo uh, and underscore uh, the thanks that Dennis gave to the entire ILD team. Uh, it's remarkable, uh, the work that you do uh, to make this conference uh, the event that it is. I also want uh, to thank Dennis um, and give us an opportunity to thank Dennis, uh, the leader of the team, uh, for what he does uh, to make this such a terrific event every year. Thank you, Dennis. And finally, of course, I want to thank you, uh, all the speakers, all the participants. I think that this has been a particularly spectacular event. Uh, I've learned a tremendous amount. I hope you have as well. And I hope you've enjoyed your time in Newport, and I hope to see you again here soon. The gavel has fallen. <laughs>